um, I, I mean, last week we looked at um, the sort of top end of the periodic table of biology that John had sketched out in the Google Doc. I can put it back up on the screen. And our discussion was gradually working towards social structures and language. Um, I, I don't know, if, is that a fair description, John, of where, where we were going last week? And Well, I, I was saying that I think that there is a linkage between the periodic table of elements, a putative periodic table of biology, and that education is, a, I think, is a derivative of um, biology. And therefore, there should be a way forward to a periodic table of education as well. And I, I was positing that the common denominator is communication. And, you know, again, that may be forced. I don't think so. I think it does hold up, but, you know, may, people may have different ideas. One thing I wanted to comment on, uh, there was something I was just reading and I, it was totally resonant with me was in terms of the question you were asking just now about the educational system is that, and Peter, I think you were saying that if you come from left field, if, you know, me as a cell biologist, I come into the field of evolutionary biology and all of a sudden I realize there ain't no cell biology in evolution. That doesn't make any sense. And so historically that was because genetics beat out cell biology. And, and here we are now in a situation where you have this disconnect between, you know, you have genetics as the ruling paradigm in biology, but you, you can't use genes to tell you what diseases are going to be developed because the, the meat in the sandwich, the cell, is, not, is non-existent, literally, until I started to publish my stuff in the non-evolution literature. But my point being that I think that's pretty much a fairly common scenario of people coming from outside of the, of the field, not being imbued with, you know, being a card-carrying whateverist, and all of a sudden they see that the emperor has no clothes. Hello? Yeah. All right. Just a couple of people have flashed up statements. I wonder if they might clarify what they said. Well, in the chat? Yeah, in the chat. Um, so we've got Mark Pearson. Um, I, yeah, Mark, can you just explain what you mean? Um, well, as I listen to you guys talk about this um, peer review process and the politics of it, I, I, I just start imagining it as, as actually a network uh, with different properties and attributes and that it it seems uh, likely pathological, <clears throat> uh, but the network aspects never see the light of day, the ones you're pointing at. Um, to me, it reminds me of the, uh, you know, the, the kind of corruption that was going on, you know, uh, that the Panama Papers exposed, and that was only doable because they, they used, in, in that case, Neo4j, but, but a property graph database that makes it quite uh, fun actually to explore um, the strange connections and linkages and so I'm just thinking you know Peter if you gather a bunch of information at least consider having a you know somebody who's facile with Neo4j um, help you analyze the data because visualizing the data is a lot different than writing a, a, a paper with serial headings and expecting the population to follow you but boy you show them graphs of corruption you suddenly get the front page of the paper well um if you if, can you give me um send me an email with chapter and stuff on that because yeah, i don't I, know sure. I, I, can make, I can make the connection there that's fine yeah sure and there, were, and there was another comment as well yeah so gordon asked um is it bad theory or is it a or is it or is it a or rather is it a or rather anti-theoretical take on Pete Gordon? You can say this. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's something that kind of I think kind of freaks me out quite a lot. Is that I think some of these people that Peter were talking about that run our universities, um, it's not so much they've got bad theory as that, that, that I said atheoretical, but more accurately, an, an anti-theoretical right. um, attitude. You know, this claim to um, just do what works that hide behind claims towards neutrality or objective that is inevitably in consequence support for the, the status quo. The kind of anti-theoretical, anti-intellectual take by those that actually run our universities. Well, there seems to be a lot of anti-intellectualism in the running of universities. And, uh, you know, we see lots of stories about it. So but I've, I've got a question for, for John Torday. If cells behave like this, we wouldn't be here, would we? <laughs> no, absolutely not. No, I agree. Um, what I just posted was, uh, my question is, is it important to dissociate ideas from money? Mm. 
because money is basically driving a lot of the activities we're talking about. And when that's kind of in the equation, it, under, it corrupts the process. It's no longer an independent, open and honest kind of sharing of ideas because people's careers, <laughs> their revenue stream, you know, funding, all that stuff is contingent on yeah. generating new ideas. And so, of course, you'd have this situation where you're, you're being undermined, right? There's also success equals money. So if you get a huge grant in, no matter that you completely bowls up your experiments and get nothing out of it, if you get the huge grant in, you're the big star. If you don't need a grant, you know, like me, then you, you, you don't count at all. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so Mark, back to your question about the cells. I guess I would equate what we were talking about with cancer. And we've actually published a paper on that idea. So I think that the homology, or the analogy, homology is cancer versus normal biology. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, I think it could make the case for that. Yeah. And uh, ideas are or well, ideas versus money is interesting in the sense that um, I would guess from your perspective, you you view ideas as a, a facet of nature. Is that is that a fair description? You know, because you see the emerging from consciousness, and consciousness emerges from the biology. Right. Right. Um, but money also, you see, what money is a peculiar thing, isn't it? Because it's it's also an idea. Sure, but I guess to be succinct, I mean, I don't think of you know economics, for example. It supply and demand is cute, but it's not really what how, how the you know societal money flows work. It's free energy. How the money is following the free energy, and if the free energy is corrupt, then it's going to undermine the mission of the organism, its environment, and the combination thereof. At least that would be, so that's why we see this undermining of the spirit and, and, and uh, flow of ideas because they're being undermined by, uh, being, they're being undermined by this other force or set of forces. Yeah. So is this, is this a, um, in a certain sense, um, the stresses that are induced by the economic system are obviously they're producing epigenetic marks, which are then having an effect on the, the, the ongoing evolution of the species. Is that, is, is, is that how you see it? I mean, there's a lot of stress happening at the moment. I think the underlying mission, I mean, you know, everything I've um, discovered in using the empiric approach to understanding the evolution of physiology indicates that it's cooperativity and let, and yet, you know, Darwinian evolution is all about competition and survival, survival of the fittest. That, that's, that's really a corruption of what actually under, underlies the mission of biology. And so you miss that opportunity to recognize the, um, the actual, and, you know, and, and Trivers wrote about, um, well, I mean, if I go all the way back to the idea that we begin in an amb ambiguous state, ambiguous state, which is very uh, difficult to cope with. And the way we've coped with it is what Trivers talks about. Well, Trivers talks about, you know, deception. And so that's kind of the, the trajectory we've gone on as a society. And I think it's why the, you go through these boom or bust cycles. But in, in saying that, I think that the, that lack of understanding of um, the ontology and the epistemology, you get these bastardized mechanisms that really aren't, they're not uh, faithful to the underlying premise of what the life form really is and how it ne needs to be take risk in order to problem solve if it's really going to be productive but we don't think of it that way i mean, yeah. I mean some of us do but you know maybe the poets do and it's weirdos like me but but that's not really we're looking at we're, we're taking a fast track and just looking at the way things appear and then trying to reason after the fact which we know is it is irrational and so that all feeds into what peter's talking about in my opinion mm. I mean, Gregory Bateson made the point that, that the, most of the problems of the world stem from the fact that we can't determine the difference between the way nature works and the way people think. And, and I wonder if um, the mechanisms that you're describing actually put a little bit more meat on the bones of that argument, because actually you're talking about a, a biological mechanism, um, which is... Uh, relating the way nature works to the way people think and potentially could help us to get a deeper grasp on the pathologies which might arise 
from those processes. Yes, yes. And, you know, as the parent and grandparent of my own children, you know, just to be succinct, I mean, I, I think about the, the, what it would, the way we raise children, and I actually said in, in, on the Google Doc that maybe the, an extension of the way we raise children is the way we educate too, is we, we do it, you know, by, um, based, based upon how we were raised with some mild, you know, tweaking from generation to generation. But wouldn't it be nice if we actually had a handbook of how to raise children that related to the first principles of life that really would be faithful to the trajectory of our evolution and not this faux process that is sort of, it's really not faithful to the central core issues of what life actually is, in my opinion. I mean, I wonder, Peter, that, that this, um, the understanding of um, biology that we've gradually been exploring over the last few weeks, it, it does seem that the, the nilpotent, the, the, um, the, the stages of nothingness in um, the different levels of organization from atom to cell to maybe even society, that also seems to be a way of thinking about this and thinking through some of these these deeper problems of why institutions go wrong. Oh, could be. Um, we, we, uh, when I was working with Peter Master on these things, on as I say, we got this concept of a quantum Carnot engine, which we didn't invent, but we thought this was an ideal um, thing to describe such systems, which are kind of semi self organizing as it were and which relate to the rest of the universe and connect by things like free energy and and so on um i i, I don't know about how easy it is to apply that to um human systems but i suspect it can be done because we know that we can apply things like entropy to human systems there's no no question that 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 concept does drive the way systems fall apart and so on. So, at what um, point does a nilpotent system go wrong? What, what, what in your in your rewrite system, for example, when when would it actually? Well, when, usually it requires some external thing to make it go wrong. Yeah, it's some com yeah, it's, it's complexity really, um, because every, everything in nature is trying to. Um, really zero itself and that means it tries to find its perfect partner to mm. annihilate it however it never does and so it, it it attaches onto one thing and then that complex thing the parts of it try to attach onto other things and we get complexity arises yeah yeah and so I mean, that that's, that's a lot to do with it and um Sometimes I think that it, if, if you've got a complex system, a very complex system, though it's a sort of negative entropy in the sense that you're creating a complex system, it's also positive entropy in the sense that it's got many connections. And so it pushes a lot, it creates a lot of entropy in the rest of the universe. And I think at some point it can get too complex for its own good. Mm -hmm. And it's the complexity which basically eventually destroys it. Because it can't handle that, or it can't handle that in the time available that it needs for handling. It's probably a time problem. It's, it loses its capacity to, to deal with the complexities. So do you think the self-destruction of our institutions, which seems to be what's happening, is a necessary balancing mechanism within the universe? Or is it something that... Um... Well, it... it Really, any anything at all, as you know, has to be maintained all the time. Mm. Any any apparatus you have, any um, your any uh, any object, any anything that you use, a clock or any any anything that you use, has to be always maintained. Your car has yeah. to be maintained. Yeah, so it requires and energy. Have, and and you sometimes have to replace the parts. Yeah, uh, because they're, they're 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 not any good anymore. And but the idea is that that. These, but every so often you think, well, this is not going to do it any good. Let's get rid of that and replace it with this. And that, that isn't being done. If you've got a complete control from the top, as you have at the moment in universities, that won't be done by the people at the top, will it? They're not going to replace themselves, you know, when they, when they, if, if they are the problem. Right. Yes. 
the man who will sack himself has has not yet been born. (laughs) (laughs) Although, I may be the first. (laughs) Are you you going to do it now? (laughs) No, 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 no. I would like to think I would sack myself if it it was for your good, but who knows? (laughs) Well, it would all be recorded here. (laughs) Well, very true. It'll go viral. (laughs) I mean, it's interesting, I think, that, you know, we pay lip service to the self organizational self-referential self-authorship of biology and yet when we actually try to practice we don't practice that it's this top-down thing um i was just thinking about my daughter was my has crohn's disease and she was hospitalized at the mass general hospital for several months and she was up on a very high floor so we'd have to take the elevator and the elevator was terrible and I'm, one day i'm mad and i'm saying something under my breath and somebody's standing next to me next to me with a badge so an employee says you realize that the executives in this uh, hospital have their offices on the first floor. So that explained volumes about why they weren't attending to this problem. If they had been on the 26th floor, they would realize what was wrong. So there's this lack of in, in, uh, integrity, I suppose, uh, integration, holism, that has to be um, taken into account. I listened to Garnet's uh, lecture on TikTok. I found it fascinating because even though I really couldn't follow exactly along, that whole debacle between Cantor and his uh, and the person who mentored him, uh, I can't remember his name. So, I found that fascinating because I thought the two of them were talking about the explicit and the implicit. Chronicle. So they were really talking about the explicit and the implicit, Bohm's concept. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, and even the idea of applied physics versus physics, physics, and the idea that applied physics is more uh, dealing with the, with the explicit, whereas physics per se, is already in the implicate order, and we're trying to trans, tr- you know, trying to transcend the explicate and, and enter as best we can the implicate. And so all of these different disciplines are dealing with that that struggle. And I, th- I would submit that you know, if, if learning institutions were dedicated to that principle, we'd we'd be a lot further down uh, down the road in terms of our understanding of means and ends. And in fact, we would be more uh, faithful to the actual nature of nature and understanding nature's principles. Yeah. I mean, what, but the question is what, I mean, education is always a practical problem um, because you've only got so many teachers and you've got a lot of learners and you've got to find ways of organizing um, uh, access to the teacher, um, uh, the activities of the students and so on. And um and and we sort of construct these entities which um, set themselves up to do the organisation, and um, or they've emerged over history. And it, increasingly, it seems that um, the world that we're preparing people for is moving too fast for the structures that we've created to cope with, um, in terms of actually the, the knowledge that's required for people to make their way in the world. Um, and I don't know, it's, it's how to think through this organisational problem, really. Well, it's when you get a company takes over another one, and it gets too big sometimes. Mm. And it, it can't handle the, the big size. Or you get an organisation, several organisations are put together and they can't handle it. Mm. Because it's basically what you said. You, you haven't got the time to deal with all the problems as they arise. Requisite mm. variety. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Well, this is where a conversation with Mark Pearson started at the beginning, and, and he mentioned Stafford Beer, and this was precisely the problem that Stafford Beer was dealing with. Um, and, and I still see it. I still see it now. I'm dealing with it now because I'm dealing with um, unmanageable variety in my institution. So, if I could jump in here, my my assessment of, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Stafford Beer's. Uh, and here's where I see the difference between biology and social uh, structures. Um, when you have meta systems, as Beer would say, you, you also need metacognition, meta concepts, meta language, meta cognition. So the problem is, you get these structures that have roles in them, and you populate the roles with non wise, non meta systemic actors. So even though the structure may be right, the, the cells, the actors in it, are, are quite incompetent for the role that they're being asked to play. If that makes any sense. Yeah. This, this, I yeah. I mean, and 
Okay, so again, we come back to the question, if, if our biology worked like that, we wouldn't be here. Right. So how, yeah. do we, how do we operate more in tune with our biology? How do we operate more in tune with nature? Well, I think I've said, you know, Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man was very, a beautiful idea, but it's not correct. Hmm. We're really not. I mean, you know, he was dealing with the, the, the syn synchronic way of looking at physiology, when in real reality, the, the fact that we go back to the unicellular state speaks volumes to me, because we actually never leave the unicellular state. And so once we understand the equipoise of the unicellular state and how it relates to the atom as homologies, now you have... Um, a process which is actually faithful to the physics and the biology simultaneously. And as Mark was saying about these incompetent people that populate uh, systems, I mean, my, my sense is that you have founding, founding fathers of whatever it is who understand first principles mm -hmm. and they create value. And then you get people who see shiny stuff and they just jump on and they weigh the whole system down. That's why we go through these boomer bust cycles. We don't need to do that anymore. Yeah. We're better than that. You know, maybe it'll take quantum com computation, but, um, but I do think that there is opportunity to break out of that cycle and, and move closer to a natural system where, uh, which is um, more, more consistent, is consistent with the ideas that we, we're sharing here in terms of the, com the homologies between biology and physics. They're palpable to me. Mm. So Mark, the other thing that you brought up uh, earlier about money, you know, money, um, you can say a lot of things about money, but really it's mostly a parameter. It's not a real thing. And when you start focusing on a single parameter and drop all other values uh, in your homeostats, you've got a disaster. And that's what we have today. We have a world that follows a parameter, not even a value, to make all of its decisions. So it, it, it is disconnected from the kinds of feedback it would need to, to persist. What does money do, Mark? It's the undoing of this country. I mean, we've we've applied the business model, and uh, you know the ver verticalization of every institution in this country. And, you know, business being the model, and then education and medicine, and on and on and on, and me measuring everything by uh, by profit and, and loss. It's it, it doesn't maybe it works and you know it seems to work in the business world, but it doesn't work with these institutions that have a much longer arc. It doesn't work in the business world. The majority of the businesses go bankrupt. Exactly. Even the big ones do eventually. Indeed. And the, ones, and the ones that haven't gone bankrupt, if you really look and you use a medical metaphor, which I came up with when I was giving a talk in Bogota, is uh, all of our big businesses are in the intensive care unit. <laughs> They're being subsidized. They have IVs. We're, we're, we're feeding them in feeding tubes. They're really already dead. <laughs> I love Gladwell. You know, in, in his book, uh, Blinky talks about you know, this debate in, at Southwest uh, Airlines about whether they should start f serving more than just peanuts. And somebody says, we're not in the restaurant business. We're, we're in the airline business. We, we need to keep focusing on our mission and our vision. And I think that that is important. You, lose, you know, you lose sight of what it is that you started with. And so then you go off on this trajectory that's not consistent with uh, the vector of the Big Bang. And all of a sudden, the wheels fall off. And then you wonder why. Hmm. I, th I think, uh, sorry, uh, no, I guess because I come from a business background, the, there is an argument at the moment in sort of organisational behaviour and psychology that organisations under pressure at the moment have actually changed who succeeds in them. So there's research to show that if you, from the outside, observe the psychology of people who are running Fortune 500 companies, running big companies around the world, they increasingly exhibit characteristics that look like psychopaths and sociopaths. Mm. <laughs> then if you go back 30, 40 years, they don't. And that the movement in economic theory to market-based pricing, the whole Chicago public choice school that swept economics, where the market can equilibrate supply and demand, price mechanism works, and that you leave most solutions to resource allocation to the market. That's become economic policy in the US, in the UK, not so much in Europe, but there's still huge elements of it. And that that actual economic ideology 
has created what we call incentive structures, ideas about agency, and ideas about how you incentivize people, much of it based on remuneration, particularly monetary remuneration, that has essentially attracted people into those roles who have very different values. They're not there for people, they're not there for the greater good, they're actually there for themselves. And increasingly they exhibit, if you believe the studies, the characteristics of people who are sociopathic and potentially psychopathic, i.e. the very centered on the self. But that's, if that's what we've done, that's because whole sets of things have happened within societies about the way we think about, I mean, money is ultimately just a store of value. It's a store of value today for something I can buy tomorrow or I cannot buy tomorrow. And if we you know, follow that line of logic through, then increasingly we think of value in a very economic sense. Can I gain more of the resource than you can? And the way we then make those allocation decisions is being based very much on a particular ideology of what we think merits value, hard work, et cetera, et cetera. Now, how you relate that back to biology, I struggle with, but I think there's an element of it there. Well, I mean, in my opinion, you know, the, the reason that what I think that what you're talking about has come to pass is because when you have, when you've, you've cut out the larger loop of the mission and vision of an organization, and all of a sudden you're reporting to your stockholders on a quarterly basis, that's where the wheels fall off because it's no longer integral to the actual process by which the organization emerged and has been able to profit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, it's a bastardization. And I, would, I, I think I could make an analogy or a homology between that and, and, an, and an organism as well, a living organism. Uh, I'm sure that the analogy, if I thought long about and hard enough about it, I could come up with, well, cancer, I guess, was probably where it would go cancer. to. It's I mean, cancer. what intrigued me is that you said time. Yes. Peter was saying that complexity <laughs> overwhelms the time available to solve it. And in fact, what we do to for-profit organizations at the moment and increasingly to universities is we say they have to perform in time frames that the complexity of what they're dealing with, the technologies they have to implement, the degree of organizational change they have to achieve is impossible in a three-month time frame. So all you're incentivizing is anything that you can do in a very short time frame. And what we do know now increasingly is that what happens is highly manipulated decisions that look great in a short time frame, but it means you've deferred difficult decisions or you've deferred capital investments or you've deferred putting in the technology that ultimately helps the company survive or the organisation survive. And universities have had that logic apart to them over the last you know, two decades at most. But we can't function in those time frames because discoveries can take eons. So I don't know how you reverse it. Sorry. Same with teaching. Because teaching at all levels, more and more pressure put onto the people delivering, more and more people they've got to deal with, and it's just not possible. The business model is not possible in teaching. You you cannot. I mean, with Garnet was saying in you know from the other group was say, is saying um, how he now has about fourteen hundred students he's got to teach now, what? and he's got he's got to d deliver programs to them. He perhaps had two or three hundred when he started. But now the same with the same conditions he's still got he's got to deal with 1400 and it there's more and more pressure put on anybody who's doing any teaching teaching in schools is full of pressure from the top all the time about delivering things which cannot be delivered i mean this 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 the stress involved in this seems to me part of a biological mechanism and um, it will have knock-on effects. Um, but I just, uh, John, I just wonder if I can ask you, because you've talked a lot about deception in biological systems, and is, is money a form of deception? Yeah, I would say so. Sure. I mean, it's the banking world. system itself is a form of deception. I mean, the whole thing started with, um, you know, people depositing gold bars and getting a, a receipt for it, which they then started to exchange. You know, it, it was a it was a con. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. Sorry, I'm <laughs> but it, it is a con because that's what happens when you lose faith in the banking system. I mean, when you get runs on the currency, that's exactly what's happened. Your faith 
in that unit of currency as a store of value has gone. And so that's why you end up with, whether it's you know, Germany in the, the late 1920s and, and massive inflation, or we can see it in several countries at the moment. Once your faith in the currency goes, doesn't matter how much of it you print. Yeah, that's right. right? Because there's no store of value anymore. Mm. You don't believe the promise that today that dollar will be worth a dollar tomorrow. Mm. So I attribute this to the, so I, I use the, the, the comparison of, you know, birds fly and humans can fly too. Well, birds are constrained by their environment. And if they don't comply with their environment, they become extinct. We, on the other hand, do the exact opposite. We are defying the laws of nature by, by acquiring the ability to fly because it's a, it's a machine like all the other machines that have, have enabled us to do things in a faster, simpler way using less energy, but in, in not appreciating the advantage, bio, the physical and biological advantage, we overarch our own constraints and that's why we cause damage because we're derivatizing everything instead of remaining to a, a system which is sustainable and, and reproducible. So that's where the money comes in. It's the money is kind of that's that's the product of that lack of constraint, and it's fueling. It's it's literally fueling this whole fall, uh, pseudo biological physical process. Oh, is it possible that one individual can approach towards being a trillionaire, as we <laughs> now seeing? Um, what's his name? Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos is on the way to doing. He's, I think he's got about 150 billion at the moment, but he's well on the way to becoming a trillionaire. How is it that a system can be devised that can, that, that can happen? Well, it, it sounds a bit biblical, doesn't it? It um, there's, <laughs> there's, there's an end to the story coming. God knows what it will be. <laughs> yeah. Biologically, that I can't even imagine a more uh, obvious example of cancer. Yeah. Yeah, it is a it is a cancer. Yeah. What role does deception play in cancer? <laughs> well, I think John ought to answer that, but isn't the main thing that, that it uh, has uh, not only figured out <clears throat> that it can grow without paying attention to its neighbors, but it's been able to deceive its neighbors so they don't pay attention to it either. So it essentially gets to grow unrestrained and uncaring. There's no yeah, there's no cooperativity there. As you say, Mark, I, well said. Yeah, I fully agree with that. That's, that's the ba basic difference. Yeah. Mm. And, and I think it's totally pr probably homologous to what we were saying about the, the effect of money, that money dissociates the principles from the actions. And that forces us into a bad scenario that, uh, you know, is our undoing or not. You know, if the system is, is um, elastic or plastic or whatever, you know, is durable, it, it will right itself. You know, like our country hopefully will when we get rid of this jackass in the, in the presidency. Um, I was thinking, you know, it's funny that, you know, uh, Trump is sitting in the Oval Office because nobody can corner him there. Sorry, I had to <laughs> Go on. No, sorry, I just, uh, I just want to come back to, to what John just said about defying the laws of nature. Isn't that, isn't that pretty much the cultural program of the West? I mean, isn't this why I think I see this overall tendency to overstretch because we're so much in still kind of enamored with this idea of building, you know, what this, I think this is the, the German philosopher Mittelstrasse, he calls it the Leonardo world, you know, it's like the world that is basically built by humans. So we use science and technology to build an artificial world that we control. And I think, I think we've, we've kind of, um, well, we lift this out in, in all kinds of ways and it's become um, a, a gravitation point for our cultural program. So I think, I, I don't know, it's just, it's like just something that popped up in my head that I thought that, Probably we, we find it very hard collectively to dial it back and, and, and maybe link to, to, to more um, biological ways of doing stuff because we're still collectively on this program somewhat. No, I agree with you, Sid, but I think that what's happened is that the material drive has uh, outstripped those things that used to mitigate against purely being materialistic education, religion. Um, 
uh, philosophy, those have all fallen by the wayside in, in favor of materialism. And I, I'm afraid that we're paying the price for that. Um, that's not healthy because all those checks and balances were what kept us on keel and and no and they're no longer doing that i mean you know the brain is a is a sink for sugar and we're just i mean our country lives on sugar now you know the um corn start, uh, you know the corn syrup stuff that laces everything so you know we're, we're just recreate we're we're recreating you know the fall of rome you know it's bread and circus in this country broadband and uh cheap food so it just seems that you're calling for the defiance of the defiance of law of nature. So um, culturally, that's quite a, a um, you know quite a stance, basically. You know, I mean, I mean, even if if we if we wanted to to take that as an as an anchor point, it, it it seems to be hard to find you know get a foot in the door, so to say. Like, where do you want to start? Linking back to more, um, you know, as you said, natural or more biological ways of being more in sync with maybe some of the biological processes and the way we go about stuff. Science is a very important um, or a very powerful mechanism for causing people to reorganize themselves though, isn't it? When, when we have new scientific evidence, new scientific knowledge, we do coordinate our actions differently. Well, if you accept, accept Bohm's hypothesis about the implicate and the explicate, the only way you can even begin to approach the, the implicate is through experimentation because otherwise we're locked into these subjective ways of looking at our so-called reality. And so, yeah, clearly, you know, the, the institutions of learning are, are, should be, do and should be fueling that curiosity, that risk-taking in terms of thought process, that asking why it is that we still are struggling with our own selves. We don't really understand. <laughs> and, you know, so you know, people are starting to call what we're entering now, um, uh, the Anthropocene, uh, a man-made environment. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. We don't, uh, the, one of the, back to peer review, one of the papers of, of the hundred, a couple of hundred I published that went right through, sailed right through was, I wrote a paper published in the International Journal of Astrobiology saying, how on earth can we understand what life is on other so-called Earths when we don't even understand how it works here? Mm -hmm. The editor loved that. He didn't even send it out for review because he felt that was a strong message to send. Otherwise, it's just this do loop. You know, we're just chasing our own tails. Ouroboros, hello. <laughs> yeah. when, um, when, I mean, John and I uh, were talking just before this about um, a, a fundamental question, which perhaps does sit beneath this discussion, which is on the one hand that we have all our logic, uh, mathematics, um, technology, and so on. Um, and and some of that mathematics um, is really quite fundamental in terms of the way the way we understand nature. But you've got to have a consciousness. You've got to have biology in order to think of the maths in the first place. And and it's 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 this question of you know where do you start going around this circle? Do you start with the logic and the mathematics, or you do, do you start with the cell? Well, you know, I mean, I, I maintain that. Um, I think that the, that the biology has to dictate um, how the physics and the, and the, and the mathematics uh, should be uh, um, utilized in order to further exploit our, our um, capacity to think. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think that you know, our consciousness, when it's convergent with the, co uh, with the consciousness of the cosmos, is where we want to be. That's really what Krishnamurti was talking about. How you achieve that, I'm not sure. I think it is something which we do when we meditate, for example. We're going back to an earlier form, and we're seeing that connection more clearly. But my bias is that the biology should, should. The biology is the, uh, is the measure. As the Greeks said, the Greeks said man is the, is the measure. I'm saying the cell is the measure. They just they hadn't gotten down to the cellular level, which is basically what they were talking about. And so... My premise was that until you had, you know, in, in my reduction of, of the bio, the inception of biology as, you know, lipid, these lipid micelles, there was no explicate order. It was all implicate. We, we determined, we life forms determined that there was an explicate. And now it's our responsibility in coming full circle to understand that and to be able to rectify that because we're still working in the paradigm of Trevor's deceptions. 
I mean, and Peter, because I mean, we've we talked as well about you know the, the nature of mathematics and the the sort of the, where it sits as a fundamental um, uh, paradigm or, or way of thinking, um, and and also where consciousness fits in that. Well, I don't think they're uh, opposed. I think they're part of the same thing. Yeah. Without consciousness, we have no mathematics. Yeah. But without mathematics, we can't explain things. Yeah. So essentially, you know, description isn't enough. We have to have mathematics as well. Yeah. We have to have that kind of structure of some, in some form or another, some kind of mathematics to be able to experiment or to do anything. Mm. Um, even biological experiments have to have mathematics. They have to have st statistics and things like that. Um, so we need we need both. If there's no point in in putting them opposed to each other because we need them all. So is this a circle? Is this a sort of Ouroboros? <laughs> it could well be. You could well think of it that way. But Peter, you, you were saying in the last Zoom, the thing I picked up on, one thing amongst many that I picked up on was you're saying that the rewrite system actually, as you move up hierarchically in that system, the next iteration subsumes the previous iterations. Yes. And that's exactly the same thing as the, bi that the biology does. In, no, in it, it rewrite system is good for biology too. I mean, I agree that that entirely is the, but, but, but you eventually have to understand the mathematics to understand a system like that. So yes. I'm saying to understand it, you need mathematics. Yeah, I agree. It's it's just difficult to determine what brand of mathematics and how to apply it. You know, that's, but, that's, uh, that's the art of doing science, isn't it? You you find out what mathematics you need. Mm. Yeah, I think we were. I mean, I mentioned this earlier on. I, I, th there was a mathematician who um, had devised a mathematical expression for the periodic table, and I was convinced that I would be able to move forward with him. But the problem was he was trying to you know fit a square peg in a round hole you needed more data than i than the world's you know body of knowledge could offer um to do so so it was a little bit too hardwired to that the way he had um deconvoluted the periodic table but i do think that some combination of um of turing's automaton with a you know connected to a um a, a boolean search form of um uh, of uh, memory and, and thought will work it's just you know then it becomes an interface i don't know how to deal with that a mathematician could do it i do think it's amenable. i think that it is amenable to mathematical um reduction yes. would it make would it make music i'm sorry <laughs> nature's mathematics is not the, the mathematics we think is clever it's what nature thinks is clever and it's usually a lot simpler than what we think is clever i think if we devise something incredibly clever and it's almost certainly wrong. Wrong, yeah. Because nature doesn't it do it that way. But, it, but so we've got to find the more simple ways of doing mathematics, which uh, are appropriate to nature at many levels. And uh, yeah, the, the, but, but saying simple doesn't mean it's easy. It's very difficult. Yeah, that's but that's right. what we have to do. All right, Mark. You were asking whether it would have, it would be musical. Yeah, I tell you, I, the reason why I asked that is because I had a discussion with um, John Williamson after the meeting last week, and um, I asked him about the glass bead game, which is something that Andrew and I have yeah. talked, talked about. He knows well, and and I said, did did Herman Hesse get it right? Uh, is it is it basically maths and music? And um, uh, and John said, actually, I just I think it's music. He, I think it's all harmony. You raised that question, and I started thinking about it after uh, in the last Zoom. And the the thought that came to me, and this may sound ridiculous, but it goes to that idea about you know jazz pianists and playing between the cracks. Isn't it possible that that the music is? Yeah, and Peter, you talk about how the biology is is bracketed as is the mathematics. So is the music bracketing the? Uh, I'm sorry, it was Vico who said, it's what is not played is the notes that are not played. It's yeah. those space gaps between the notes that actually is a place where the communication occurs. Yes. It's an opportunity for the nexus between our consciousness and the consciousness of the cosmos, for example. And I said to you, you know, Beethoven's fifth, ba 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 bam is very different from uh, ba 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 bam right? 
So it's all a matter of how you start the thing off and how it sort of finds that light motif that gives you that opportunity to understand that there is organization in the cosmos. We just have to figure out how to understand it in a way where it actually is faithful to its origins, its trajectory, its... Well, perhaps we also need to find ways of doing experiments to defend how we see things and we, as, as a basis for um, making an argument as to how we should reorganize ourselves. Well, I, I mentioned that um, there was a, an article in the New York Times Magazine section that Rich Heidelberg actually turned me on to about this guy, Angelo um, Bassi from the University of Turin. And the whole article is about how Bassi thinks that there's, this, there's a certain sign human signature in the way we think about quantum mechanics, which has to be removed in order for us to really understand quantum mechanics. That's what I've been arguing for years, that there is a signature. We, not, we need to step back and to extricate ourselves from the process in order to understand it. Otherwise, we're just, it's just reinforcing our own narcissistic biases. Hmm. I know Peter's, Peter's made the comment before now, um, uh, you, you, you'll correct me if I get this wrong, but basically once, once we understand quantum mechanics, we'll realize that we always understood it or we always, it was, it was something that was always with us. I don't yeah. think it's not understandable now. Hmm. I don't think there's a problem with quantum mechanics. It, it is just the way people are looking at it. They expect it to be like their macroscopic um, experience. And of mm. course it isn't, because it's nature's math mathematics, not ours. Yeah. And yeah. if you understand nature's mathematics, and to me that means uh, making space and time basically um, complete variables. Mm. And if you do that, then there's no difficulty in understanding quantum mechanics at all. Mm. I mean, all the rest is completely pointless. And if you've seen my lectures on quantum mechanics, you see I huge great simplifications in it mm. which explain a lot of things without having having to have hugely complicated um, clever mathematics sometimes you need that but mostly you don't mm. because nature's way of doing it if we just happen upon nature's way of doing it then then it, it's easy for us it's just not easy for us to get to that because we're so prejudiced by our own uh, senses by, by what we see immediately we think that's the way nature does it and it isn't the way nature does it no, nature doesn't think concrete things are simple it thinks the opposite it thinks they're complicated complex simple things are simple but that's that's what krishna muji was saying was that our, our egos get in the way of our perception of what actually is occurring in nature and um i don't i mean maybe this is too metaphysical but even the the two slip experiment the idea that you try to measure it and all of a sudden it evaporates. I think that's because we are we see the two slit, the results of the two slit experiment, but it's only when we, there's convergence of our consciousness with the co consciousness of the cosmos that we really understand or, or would be able to understand what that process actually um, um, represents. Short of that, we're still imposing our own phys um, our own egocentric biases on the process. We, certain expectations have to be met that are not valid. I think that's what we're sa you're saying, right? Yeah, the nilpotent structure makes the two split, sl slit, as it were, split, slit experiment completely understandable. Yeah. You, you simply have the bracket, which is the fermion, the state, whatever it is, and you're assuming it's electrons doing the slit. It doesn't matter which, but let's assume it's electrons. And if you um, send it through both slits, you will get the interference pattern because uh, uh, because space and time are completely variable and you're connecting with the rest of the universe. That is a non-local phenomenon. Mm -hmm. If you then block off one of the slits, you're introducing a local phenomenon, which therefore changes what's inside the bracket and therefore changes the pattern. And it's really not that difficult. Mm -hmm. It's well within the compass of the mathematical structure, and we don't need anything really esoteric to explain it. You don't need a pilot wave either, do you? I don't need a pilot wave. That's just a model that you can use if you wish. I don't need it, no. I mean, so if, I would... if you did embrace that, what, what, there would have to be, again, there would have to be some reaction in the okay. universe to deal with it. 
the pilot wave is just another way of getting the non-locality. It's a model for getting the non-locality, but you don't need a model. It is just a non-locality, which is fundamental in the structure that you've created. Okay. If it's a nil potent structure, it automatically has a non-local connection with everything else. Yeah. And it's so only would, within itself. I would maintain that if there were the possibility of mathematically expressing evolution the way that I've rolled it out cellularly, and you could then you could factor out the human the human subjectivity, and I think I would predict that it would be a rewrite for the system. Well, I, th I think it, the rewrite system almost certainly will explain it, because it does explain evolution with a small e uh, of, of how everything evolves into everything else. So well, we already said that the cell and the uh, uh, zero and the cell are both attractors. So already, the initiation of the process is already we're agreeing is common to both. The question is how, as you move forward, does the rewrite program emulate the cellular um, mission, if you will, or process of creating itself and then recapitulating itself and sustaining itself over space time? Yeah, I don't think it's a huge problem and i don't think it's usually complicated mathematics to get the basic idea yeah. yeah so can we start from there and um make a it's it's almost i'm although this has been a slightly depressing conversation because we started with the terrible things about peer review and all the rest of it um these these ideas are incredibly exciting and they would they seem to be important and they seem to be maybe the foundation for doing some practical work which might actually make a difference or am i being over optimistic i don't think there's such a thing as over optimistic you've got Thank to have optimism to <laughs> can i ask a question i mean i just occurred to i was just writing down what we in my own one how this all out but it just if peter if is is there is there some way that your rewrite system could come back to zero, or does it naturally? Because that's really what I'm saying about cell biology. It goes back to you cell. How do you go back to zero with your rewrite system? The rule is always zero. Every every stage of it's zero. It's just a different zero. Okay. There's no. It's not back to zero. It's all zero. But but what happens is that you can start it anywhere so you can start with one structure instead of another structure and always nature will create a structure where you can start it progress again in that in that way well and that's where the homeostatic or homeoretic principle comes in it, it's the same i mean once you introduce homeo, homeostasis then you're, that's what you're talking about is that constant um, maintenance of the, the no potent state yeah, I, I just think we might need to inspect what we mean by homeostasis um, in that context, though, because I think the nil potent, if, if you understand homeostasis as a nil potent process, then it's vertical as well as horizontal. Whereas I think for, for systems people, particularly when they say homeostasis, they don't, they don't see the history. No, no, that's the problem. With that's the exactly, that's, that is the problem with systems, yes. Yes, that's right. There's no attempt, there's no effort, no need. At least that's my sense of in having a back to and forth with a systems but, uh, right. theorist for many months, John Kahneman. And he just basically said, I, I don't need what you're talking about. Or, or even Greg Enriquez, the psych yeah. clinical psychologist, saying, I don't need uh, an explanation for my tree of knowledge uh, a schematic. Which I offered him. I said I, I can. He, talk, he talks about the interface between the different levels of the tree of knowledge as joint points. I said I think that the joint points are what I talk about. Yeah. He didn't want that. No. He didn't see it as of any value. Yeah, and I, I completely agree. And I think that's another area where this is extremely important because obviously my background is in systems. Um, we've got some systems people here, Mark and Kerry. Um, we are saying something here very important about homeostasis and homeostasis underpins the work of Stafford Beer, Gordon Pask, all of these people. And, and I think there is a different perspective here. You don't have history and systems structures, then you, you won't understand them. Sorry? If you don't, if you ignore the history and a system structure, Absolutely. you will not understand it ever. Absolutely. Or you, you'll believe you, you believe that you do understand it, 
but you'll be deceived. You will. And that, that may be part of the problem that we've got at the moment, um, is that we're, we're, we're kidding ourselves that we understand this stuff when we really don't. Those that don't know their history are condemned to repeat it. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Can we quote you on that? What do we have to? Well, it's not my quote. I think it was Santayana or somebody. But you know, it's a famous quote. <laughs> you can't quote it, Mark, my my concern is that the lack of uh, any desire to do the deep dive of history and systems theory is an assumption that there's a prime mover, and that basically that just pulls the rug out from any interest in trying to understand uh, um, origins and. Uh, I'm sorry, ontology and epistemology. It, it's not pertinent. Mm. I think it's the whole name of the game, but uh, that's my bias. Mm. I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think people have different, there are certainly people who, within the systems community, who believe that there is a prime mover. Um, I can name a few of them. Um, uh, I don't think it applies to everybody, but I think, um, I think it, that the connection perhaps hasn't been made because an understanding of the underlying mechanism hasn't, hasn't, hasn't really occurred to people. Um, but there are some fundamental problems. You know, I, the, the one that really um, struck me is um, ergodicity and, and the non-ergodicity non of life. Um, well, you know, everything that um, is described in cybernetics is to do with automata and automata are ergodic systems, but we're not. Um, that's because we connect with the, with the environment, yes, whereas right. computer systems don't. Yeah. Correct. Well, not only do we connect with the, the environment, we are of the environment, like Sagan told us at the end of his Cosmos show. And that's the difference between an anthropic principle, which is we are in this environment as opposed to we are of this environment. They're two, diametrically different and, and, and fundamentally change the way that your worldview. Sorry, Andrew, you want to say something? I thought. No, no, I just, I, I agree. I'm writing it down. That's very good. Okay, so um, um, it's, it's, uh, we've been going just over an hour. Um, uh, do you want to continue for a bit more or shall we, shall we break off and, and meet next week? It's up to you. I have a general question. Um, John and I have been having discussions and <clears throat> Almost anything I say, he tells me is an information flow. Oh, sorry, is an energy, energy flow. flow. Yes. Yeah. So I want to know what does energy mean? What does energy flow mean? And how would you illustrate an energy flow in any of these various fields? And how would you define energy? Because I, I really want to move back to the really elementary basics on our fundamental terms. Before I, we start looking at the complications when you bring in uh, history, philosophy, and economics, and biology. I think that's a very important question. Peter? Well, it's free energy we're talking about. Oh, I don't know what that means. That means energy that is useful, as opposed to, say, heat in physics and so on. But energy that can do something. I, don't, I, don't, I personally don't believe there is actually an energy flow. It's it's more like um, action or angular momentum that actually changes, not not energy. But the energy has to be there, and there has to be sufficient energy to do the thing that you need to do. In physics, we define it as the capacity to do work, to move a force a certain distance. But the the thing is that as we as you lose, as you don't. Uh, to maintain the supply of free energy, you need you need to co to have contact with your environment, mm. because otherwise it will go down and down, and your system will become more entropic and uh, eventually fail. Entropy is like a kind of reverse of it. Right. But Peter, uh, lots of people. Sorry, Richard. What I think you just uh, said, Peter, is that closed systems aren't useful. Closed systems? In a closed system, your entropy will increase forever and you're done. Yeah. You have to have That's an correct. external source of energy in order to do anything. 
Yeah, you, you can't actually do anything fundamental with a closed system. It'll eventually just die. You know, and that's it, it, and because it's not got anything to replenish the the um, the energy it's used, not uh, not so much incorporated but used. And okay, so what is this energy stuff that we're using? What is it? Yeah, let me take a very simple example. I have a coffee cup up in the air, and there's potential energy in it. So if I let go of it, it will fall on the ground and, and smash. Okay, so w w what what energy, what does that energy mean in that setting? Well, it, to actually fall, it has to have kinetic <laughs> energy, so it has to have energy of motion. But it, it can only do that if there's, a, if there's a potential forcing it down to the ground. If there's a force involved. Gravity? Is that gravity? Gravity, yes. Gravity is the force involved, yeah. Okay. So... And, but but, the, but it, it wouldn't do anything if you put it on a ledge. It would stay where it was. It would still have that same potential energy, but it wouldn't be able to do anything because it couldn't convert it into kinetic energy. Right. That's why when I held it up, I said I could release my hand and then it would drop. Mm. So, what is this energy? What is it? Yeah. Well, it's just a, a, a quantity that's measured. That... Uh, that there's lots of different ways of describing it, but in physics, it's force times distance. It's moving, moving in against a force or with a force. So you, your cup moves a certain distance on the force of gravity. So the force times the distance is what we call the energy. And that, that we know is, is overall a conserved quantity. So you've got, you've got, um, gravitational potential energy to start with, then you've got kinetic energy, and then you've got heat energy when it smashes to pieces. But the heat energy isn't useful energy in, 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 because it's dissipated. See, it's not, so that's not what we'd call free energy anymore because it's dissipated energy. It's constrained in biology because it's converted into chemical, a chemical form that's stored or utilized, like adenosine triphosphate, for example. This well, is a different, different kind of potential energy because you can do something with it eventually. Right. No, but, you know, Rich was calling me on this issue of um, a negative entropy being, you know, sort of uh, the deceptive force of biology saying that, well, no, it's an open system, so the heat does dissipate, but I would maintain it's constrained to a certain, to a certain degree, and that's, that's that debt that we owe to, to nature, which we utilize over the course of the life cycle because we're able to circumvent the second law of thermodynamics up to a point, then we have to give it up. Right, and I claim that we're not circumventing it at all. We're just throwing out waste energy into the outer environment because it's not, a, it's not a closed system. You look in, that, you look in the slightly larger system and entropy uh, keeps increasing in the larger system. Yeah, that's, that's correct. In the whole system, the energy increases. Entropy. Life is a particularly entropic form of, of activity. Uh, and entropy is bigger if you've got more connections, more things connecting with other things, and life is very complicated. So it does create a lot of entropy into the universe. But locally, it's able to, get to have what looks like a negative entropy. But overall, it can't have it a very right. As long as you stay local, you can do that. Yeah. But in, in the locality, in the locality, then you're not phrasing it right. No, if you've got just if you've <laughs> only got locality, then nothing will then then it will never overcome that neg negative entropy. That'll just a positive entropy. It'll just go out into the universe. But that's why you need the cellular communication. So you cellular. start. That's why you need the cellular communication principle. Then it becomes distributed. Right, so you have both. You can have it both ways. It's local and negative, but it's distributed, and 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 um, yeah. So it's it's satisfying both criteria. Life is okay. Have fun. No, but I, I guess I would submit, Rich, that when I thought it over again, yet again, I would submit that the the, the thermal energy within the cell 
uh, is still going to be in a negative state compared to what's occurring outside of it. There's some heat that's transferred clearly, but it's, it, there has to be a difference between having a cell with a cell membrane uh, as opposed to mushing it up and then looking at how, you know, in a cal and putting it into a calorimeter. This, that's two different processes. There is constraint and there's cons conservation of the thermal energy within the cell. That's the trick of the vital force. But I don't believe it. You have some radiation coming in from the sun that gets to the outside of your cell wall and it makes things happen and then it kicks out some waste heat to the outside again. Yeah, that's right. I agree with that. Yeah. You, it, without that in, out in external input, nothing would happen. But there's some conservation of that energy within the cell. Well, there are various conservation laws within the, within the structures. that They're structured so that they conserve various things, angular momentum and momentum and and energy within themselves. Right. So as long as you've got force laws involved, then then you will get you can get local structures that can be maintained given supplies from the outside. Yeah, you got to have the supply from the outside. You got to have that, and you have to have the heat loss for the outside. But again, I, just to reiterate, I would say that if you had some inert, you know, like car bucky balls, you know, in a solution and you hit it with, with um, a light beam, uh, I'm sorry, with, with sunlight, some energy source, that's going to be a very different kinetic from uh, living cells. A living cell will retain some of that information as energy within it. That's and because of its local structures. It's got it's got many local structures, right. and and they have to all obey their own laws. Yes, and that's right. why it works. Whereas the buckyball has very few local structures, if it, if at all. Right. It's, there's no compartmentalization within the buckyball. It, it's non-existent. I mean, you could create it, but we're talking about just a, a you know a structure that's got that's just got a plasma inside of it. So yeah, the heat goes in, the heat goes out. Whereas in a, in a cell, the heat comes in, it's converted into some, you know, like carbohydrate, and it's stored within the cell. So the energy is not dissipated. It's, it's retained. It's, it's kicking out waste heat. No, no, but it's retaining some of that energy in the form of sure. um, lipids and carbohydrate and protein and not other right, right, so have a sandwich and go around a mile. And you will discover that you got very hot, the outside got hot, you evaporated stuff. And you dissipated a whole bundle of energy. But not all. About one sandwich worth. Some of it is retained within the system. Why? Or entrained, or yeah, entrained, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. There's a French sociologist called Georges Bataille who wrote uh, <laughs> an extraordinary, uh, Andrew's laughing, yeah, uh, he wrote an extraordinary book on economics called The Accursed Share. And his argument was that actually um, chair, the, accursed what? the accursed yeah. chair, chair. chair. I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Um, okay. His argument was that um, economic behavior is driven by the need for, um, well, in fact, all organisms, but human beings to expend excess energy, which they gain from the sun. And so, and he says, well, actually, if you look at, um, if you look at human behavior, you see, um, um, patterns of um, excess and destruction as the common the common denominator throughout all periods in history by which he means everything from war to building pyramids and uh, giant monuments and goodness knows what but they're all processes whereby energy is expended um, and squandered in his view and he, he talked about squander as being the fundamental sort of um, uh, driver in economic behavior and then use this to explain um, uh, economic practices like potlatch, giving, giving. Um, Isn't that the consumer very... society? Sorry? Isn't that the consumer society trying to get uh, you to squander everything? Well, it's, it, it, um, Bataille's ideas are quite closely related to um, uh, Thorstein Veblen's ideas. He had, he had a similar thing. Um, but, but Bataille goes a bit further because he, he has a sort of biological mechanism that sits behind this. I'm just I'm just throwing this in because I think I think actually this discussion is really fascinating, um, and um, if, if it's when when we look at just to bring it back to 
where we started really when we look at the behavior of some of the people at the top of our organizations it's incredibly wasteful um and, and maybe there's an explanation for that that's i think what you're saying is what i'm saying and that is that what i'm trying to say that there is that energy with free energy within the cell is constrained the excess energy yeah you start messing around with that and you get maybe you get some bad stuff happening because yeah. they don't know what to do with it um but yeah but there has to be some energy which is constrained that's the whole point of the compartmentalization process mm. why it exists why it, Organelles would exist within the cell. Mm. Wow. Okay. I, I I think we sort of we maybe we've reached a natural pause. Um, does anybody has anybody not said anything who wants to say something um, at this stage? Yeah, I, I do. I type I typed it in there. When I watch uh, the conversation jump between physics and cells, and then uh, without clear connections jump to sociology such as how we started the call it um it's confusing i i, I would love to have in another meeting at least some attention paid to uh language because um you know uh, i think Maturana and Brella and others um kind of got it right Wittgenstein, austin searle that uh to a certain extent people live in stories and language. And if we don't uh, have a, a way to acknowledge that in our conversations and we, we try to jump from cells and physics to people without acknowledging that the interactions are linguistic, the odds of our metaphors and our thinking being applicable are minimal to none in my opinion. So I'd love to have at least have that join. I don't use it as conflict. I, I just like to see it joined into this thinking. Uh, yes, I, th I think I, I think like to simplify that because I don't think language is the right level. Yeah, um, I like John's idea of communication, yeah. and, and the language is one mechanism for dealing with communication. But I want to know what really is a communication. What does intracellular communication mean? Are you moving energy around? Is it an example of that? Well, yeah, chemistry and conversation are different. Uh, I don't think it, it shouldn't be exclusive. It should be, we shouldn't push language, human language out. It's a, a very important form of communication and its form and how we use it is probably more critical to the outcome of this planet than uh, a lot of the other terribly interesting things you guys talk about. So we just need to integrate human conversations into this story because human conversations are the things that uh, and i don't just mean words that end up having nouns predominate over verbs money predominate over life so we, we need to get that in here somehow well I, th I think that there's a need to talk about this and and obviously language is at the bottom of john's um uh table that he presented last week um i am very conscious though that um we are in a sense going beyond the system's view and and so basic concepts like homeostasis are up for grabs so um it's 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 not that we can settle on something like maturana and varela or uh, or even wittgenstein and and sort of take that as an explanation i think we've got to look deeper can i just say that i mean yes. Yes. mark i don't know if you're interested but i wrote a paper on on how niche construction actually is the origin of society because when the cell internalizes factors in the environment, that was the beginning of the merging of ecology and cell biology. And so if I marry that with my uh, idea of the central, uh, the central theory of biology being the, the evolution of uh, bipedalism in humans, that actually is what gave rise. So just to, I can put, I can post those, the references to those papers, but, yeah. but, but by by equating tool making and language, that actually is the dynamic that is you know is is driving society in my opinion because and, and you know and, and physiologically the area of Broca is where those things merge. Mm -hmm. We know that, and that's unique to uh, primates, particularly humans. Yeah, so, and maybe my my focus, I you know I I can sit and listen to you guys for probably months and and enjoy all of it and keep quiet. But my interest is is actually in what can be done uh, to avoid uh, the impending disaster. So I, I'm much more of a 
a practitioner than, uh, but I, I, I believe that I, to act without theory is, is uh, 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 destructive. So I, 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 I try to, I try to do the two together, but my world is mostly what can people do <laughs> to avoid the inevitable, otherwise inevitable outcome of the Anthropocene. So maybe that's not really what this con this forum is about. So I can I can be quiet on that. Yeah. Well, I, I've, said, I've, said, I've said in the past that I think that the the human condition is one in which we can we are unique in conceiving of past, present, and future simultaneously. And we know that we are mortal. That drives us crazy. If we only were to understand the underlying principles that have gotten to this, us to this place, I think we would be better off. If I, I think that's what, I, that's what I'm hearing from you. We need that kind of overriding understanding of where, where the wheels came off for human understanding of, of, of where we came from and where we may be going. Because we need to understand understanding too. And Mahomes gave us a lot of things, but 20 years ago, I he reading his work on dialogue and how the mind works was a gift from Bohm. <laughs> it was an amazing gift that changed my entire perspective of what it is to be a thinking human being. As soon as you understand that memes in your head are basically taking over and lying to you on a daily, moment by moment basis, that's a kind of cool thing to understand. I agree. Well, and I think that in the, if you watch that video about Bohm, his biography, I found when he said that he was trying to find something greater than science, I think he was talking, he realized that our consciousness and the consciousness of the cosmos have to converge. That's what he was after. It's his politics that fascinated me. The idea that his political convictions could find expression in some of his ideas about physics. That, that, I, I didn't know that stuff. That was very interesting. Oh, you mean it's communist stuff? Mm. Huh. Yeah. I mean, the, the tree of life ends up saying in the end, they, they step it back a little bit, but the very last part of, you know, Matra and Varela is biologically human linguistic beings starting from a single cell organism um, are designed or optimized for love. I mean, that's, you know, uh, <laughs> that's pretty interesting. And, and I, I don't use that word personally much, but I think that we are, um, we are social beings who, who can work together. And somehow all that Bohmian stuff is necessary. His insights are necessary to avoid going the wrong eye, to going in the ditch. But they could be completely wrong. <laughs> you just you. All I'm saying is they're they're useful, and on uh, and the, yeah, for me, right and wrong and useful. I don't know. I get. I try not to throw out the useful because I have doubt. Mm. Okay. Well, um, thank you ever so much, everybody. It's, it's, what a what a ride this is in terms of um, going from peer review to um, language and biology. Um, uh, I, I, we'll throw some stuff in the Google Doc. Don't, John's put some interesting stuff that stemmed from last week's discussion. Um, please have a look at it. I'm, I'm, I must confess, I'm, I'm crazily busy at the moment, so I'm not getting much time to do this. But um, there is, there is quite a lot of stuff in there now, and uh, it's, it's all fascinating. So, um, thank you very much, and see you next week. Okay. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.